this one. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome back to another episode of the Shaft Podcast. My name is Andrews. Um, I would be hosting this episode together with Erasmus um, for some part of it. Um, today, we are here to discuss happenings at PADC 2023. And for most of you who, um, or for those of you who are listening who do not know what PADC is, it stands for the Pan-African Investors Debate Championship. For us within debate, it's the pinnacle of African debate. It is the platform where we go to express our ideas, where we go to share our thoughts, and also eventually battle out who becomes the reigning champion of the African continent. Ultimately, it also serves as the platform where we export Africa's greatest debating talents for the world to see what we are made up of. And so for us, PAUDC is a measurement of who we are, of where we've got into as a continent debate-wise, and also what we want to export to the African continent and um, from the African continent to the world. And that's why when things happen on that platform, we want to take it serious and we are all interested in how they go as well. Um, so in this discussion, we'll be talking about a lot of things based on the things that you've heard happened. Um, but we have here two um, very important personalities who are going to take us through the details and happenings at PADC as well. And so our first person um, who joins us is Nolutando, um, who was chief adjudicator for the just ended PADC. So um, welcome, Nolu, and happy to have you here. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. Awesome, awesome. The second person is Ayafa, who is current PADC council chair. And the PADC council is the institution that oversees the organization and the execution of PADC as well. So um, it's good to have him here. Thank you very much for joining Ayafa, and you're welcome. Hey, guys. Nice to be here. Amazing. Um, the third person on this show is no other than Erasmus, uh, who joins us as a co-host for this episode. Erasmus, you deserve no introduction, but you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Really, really looking forward to this discussion today. Yeah. So um, let's dive right into it. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say congratulations to, to you both who are here, to Nolu first and foremost for pulling PADC through, especially being at the helm of affairs, um, leading the CA team. And from what we we saw and what we heard, um, CAP ended up performing way more functions beyond CAP functions just to execute the competition. And so um, from myself, from Erasmus, and I believe from the entire African continent, we would just like to extend congratulations to you um, and the entire team as well, and appreciate the efforts that you put in. Uh, same to Ayafa. I think on this episode, we'll get to discuss what each of you and your various teams had to do to make sure TMPADC eventually came back to a success. And so, congrats. Um, I would also just like to extend congratulations to the champions um, of PADC, both in public speaking and in debate. In debate, um, Prosper Michael and Umuhari Rao Hassan who won the debate championship for Prosper is, um, myself and Erasmus have always used the saying that for people who win by consistently appearing on the stage, they usually deserve a significant amount of recognition and credit. And having won PADC um, off the back of appearing in the world's final is just testament to his quality, his, his um, strength as a debater and the kind of personality that he has, but also to Umu, who hasn't been speaking a lot, but showed that from the lessons that she had gained from judging, speaking was very, very um, easier now for her and doing the things that most people don't see to do. Um, so for me, I would just like to ask this question on from your perspective as well, Nolu, being uh, CA and also having judged a lot of times and spoken as well. What do you think judging gives speakers? Um, because from Umu's perspective, and I think myself and Erasmus had a brief chat about this, what you saw in her speeches were more of advocacy, not just argument, but also advocating for whatever her team was arguing for. And that's something we usually don't see speakers do a lot. 
And so if you could just shed a little light on why speakers should sometimes just settle down and judge to learn certain lessons, that would be very good for everyone as well. Yeah, I think judging more than anything requires a lot of listening. Something that I find that speakers who exclusively speak don't always do. And so what often happens when you begin to listen from a judging perspective is that even yeah. in speaking, you listen from that same perspective as well. Okay. What I picked up, and I'd seen Umo speak, I think, twice in the tournament, and both times she was speaking whip. And from those whip speeches, it was very clear that she had been paying so much attention to the entire debate that the things that she chose to listen to were largely the most contentious things and those things that would be in discussion during deliberation. So I think it gives you a new perspective. It forces a lot of listening. And to that degree, then, I think it assists speakers to be able to understand what needs to be responded to, what needs to be made better in their own cases, and ultimately really does make a more effective speaker. Awesome. Erasmus, do you have, do you have a comment to pass here? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think it was um, a brilliant performance. I think the first time I watched her speeches, I was like, "This this is incredible!" Like she's doing what um, a judge is supposed to do within the debate, and being able to highlight the more contentious issues, like Nolu said. I think it was one of the first things I I noticed, and then just being able to explain it and get into the heads of the judges and um, just an understanding of how these judges are able to make their decisions and reflect them within the debate almost sounds like a cheat code um, to me. For me, I would also say that um, a compliment, complimented Prosper also really, really well, especially because you could see the maturity also in him in terms of the argumentation that he's able to bring on board and how he's able to place those debates. And I say with this achievement and this record in collaboration with appearing on the world's final stage, and for me, it's, it's good status. He enters the conversation um, as part of Africa's grades. Yeah, definitely. Um, so congratulations to you also, Ayafa. I would, I would just like to ask, how tough was this for council? And um, just starting the conversation with you, when was the first time you had an interaction that suggested to you that things were going south with this PADC? Uh, could you just repeat, suggested what? When was the first time you had a conversation that suggested, suggested what? to you that PAUDC was going south, as in problems, big, big cracks and big problems were starting to emerge? Okay, so I think I need to give a lot of backstory to this, because if I don't, people won't understand where I'm coming from. So, first off, I never liked the Togo bid. This was because I felt like a lot of the processes that were done in getting the bid in would like be a bit contentious. I'll probably get into that later, but it was problematic. But I I abstained from voting during ratification, even though everybody else for votes for ratification. So you're assuming that the bid is going to be good. Yeah. The first red flag I saw, if I'm being honest, was when they announced the list of teams that were registered for PEDC. Because you know they always do this flyer, they have a set ton of teams, and how the schools don't show up. So I noticed that one, my university is there, and I know I haven't registered them. So I'm like, okay. mm -hmm. but I'm like, maybe they're just fairly confident that the defending champions will show up. So I'm going to charge that to the game. Then the second university that catches my tech, my information is Lautech, Ladeke Akintola University of Science and Technology in Nigeria. The problem is that this university has like significant structural issues to the point where it's open like barely three months in a year. So I'm like, how is the university that's open barely three months in a year registry for PEDC? I was like, hmm. I'm like, it's fine, it's vibes, it's vibes. So I consistent at that point here, yeah, that's like the first set of red flags. So I'm now like, okay, at least once or twice in a month, at least twice a month, three, four times maximum. I would check in on Latif. So I tried checking in once every week. Sometimes I forget. But at least within two weeks, I would have checked in on Latif to see how the tournament is doing. Yeah. And he keeps on saying, it's, it's fine. We are doing well. And the thing is, 
what I need to do, like, I probably should have asked for more evidence, but I, I genuinely, at that point, trusted, you know what, he's probably like, what, it can't be that bad. And then, Lucien and Nolu arrive at Togo. And this is where things go, like, absolutely sideways. And then Lucien, like, Nolu first tells me, sends me videos of the rooms at Saburu. I think it's Saburu, yeah? And the first issue is the sockets. But I just realized, okay, like, it's French sockets. That's the problem. It's not It's not a big deal. Calm down. But, like, the, the, the rooms actually don't look, like, they look bad. But, like, I'm like, I would survive. And then on Friday, while I'm seeing LDO, I get a text from I get a text from Lucien that says the tournament almost is about to get cancelled. Hold it here, yeah, like, for me. Hold it. I've tried to sort out. Hold, oh. Hold it here for me. Hold it here. I want us to to backtrack yeah. a little bit and get Nolu's perspective, given that she was on the ground early before you got that call. So, Nolu, what I want here now is walk us through your arrival. When you got there, what was communication with Latif like? How were you received? What were the first pieces of information that you got? And when really did the, the panic start? Sure. So, we arrive at the airport, and yeah. obviously, it's a French speaking airport. I do not speak French. Luckily, I am with Lucien, who does. Okay. We get there and the letter we were given that would grant us entry into the country seems to be starting conversations at the airport that I don't understand. And already I'm starting to wow. panic. Okay. Finally, Lucian gets the immigration officers to accept the letter and we get our visa stamps and we get into the country. At this point, I'm on the phone trying to get a hold of Latif. Yeah. Eventually he picks up, I think after the third call, because I've now sent him a message telling him, if you don't pick up your phone... I am going to get my ticket changed and I'm going home right now. Yeah. He finally picks up the call and he says, listen, I'm in a meeting. I'm going to get someone to come and get you guys. Fine. My thought process is I'm going to get someone to come and get you guys means 20 minutes yeah. of waiting. Maybe first hour hits. We've not heard from this man. We try and call him. He's not picking up. Wow. <laughs> Second hour hits. And we start thinking we need to find alternative ways to get out of this airport. At yeah. this point, we start calling everybody with a Togolese number in the groups. We eventually get to Lydia, who honestly was a breath of fresh air the entire time we were there. And she says, I'm going to organize someone to come and get you. It might take me a little while, but it's going to happen. About two and a half hours to three hours later, somebody finally arrives and they say to us, we're going to take you straight to the university. I'm like, no, we've been traveling for nine hours. We've been waiting at your airport sweating for three hours we need to take a shower they yeah. tell us no uh they've not gotten permission from latif to take us to the hotel this is where the alarm start ringing for me because i'm like what do you mean you don't have permission to yeah. take us to the hotel so at this point i ask one of the guys who are in the car call him because he's not going to pick up my call yeah they call him he answers we take the phone and we're like yo we need to go to the hotel and get ready. Like, no, it's fine. They can take you there. We get to the hotel. Well, what they call a hotel. As soon as you enter the door of that place, already yeah. something is wrong here. It makes no sense that you're bringing delegations from all over the continent to this yeah. place. But I'm like, okay, let's give it a benefit of the doubt. Maybe the front is not an indication of what's happening inside. Inside, yeah. They take us to a room. And when you mm. open the door, the first thing that hits you is just must. It's it's a weird smell that doesn't make sense. And it's next to a brewery, so that makes it even worse. Mm. I made the mistake of opening the bathroom door. What hit me was a stench I've never come across before. <laughs> And it was at that point that I knew we were in massive trouble. And I call him. He doesn't pick up. We call him again. And I think after an hour of trying to get a hold of him, he finally picks up and he says, I'm still in this meeting. It's an emergency meeting. I will call you as soon as possible. About an hour later, we call yeah. and he says, I'm on my way. I'm coming to you. He gets there three hours after that call. It's about... 8 to 9 p.m. at this point. Yeah. 
we've gotten to this place we've not eaten because we don't know where to get food first and foremost and we're just annoyed at this point we're ready to unleash on this man yeah when we open the door this man looks so defeated and with him is a, a someone who's apparently a lecturer but also doubles as an immigration officer but that's a chat for a later stage yeah they then come in and tell us well um the university wants to cancel the tournament wait 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 so after the long hours of stress <laughs> there is no breather and you are hit with the follow up that says the university wants to cancel the tournament yes that's, that's what exactly what happens competition. yes this is the day before people are going to start arriving vitz is already on a flight forte are already on a flight the librarians wow. are already driving down so are the ghanaians <laughs> <laughs> so at this point we have a conversation and the conversation is we now have an international crisis on our hands. Yeah. Our faces are on this bid and beyond the fact that our faces are on this bid, institutions have made payments to yeah. bring their students here. These include registration and flights and yeah. all other related expenses that they've had to deal with. Two things are going to need to happen if you're canceling. One, you need to pay everybody back the money that they've spent and you also need to pay them back for money that is spent outside of the actual tournament itself but expenses yeah. towards the tournament yeah this is when the conversation gets a little bit tricky and we're telling them the extent of the problem at this point Latif then says i tried but the university wants to give us only five million five million in the local currency is probably about two thousand dollars no yeah. tournament is going to run on two thousand dollars it's I mean, virtually rego, impossible rego for five people is already that <laughs> so <laughs> exactly he then also mentions that a significant portion of people people who normally pay prior to the tournament are coming yeah. to pay in person now this is strange because i think the standard norm is that only zimbabwean teams pay in yeah, person usually pay in person yeah yeah and this is because of the forex issues that they deal with yeah. And you may have maybe a couple of Nigerian teams who may have similar problems, but the tournament is happening in Togo. So it's unlikely that they have those kinds of problems because they're neighboring countries. Yeah. So the question then becomes, so what do we do? Because we're not taking the option. His option for us is we're going to give you guys money. Um, you guys are going to spend the next few days here as a holiday. And we're like, there's no way. What? At this point, this is us being made part of a scam that we don't understand. So we're like, there's yeah, absolutely yeah. no way we can do that. Because it doesn't matter what you give us and how long we stay here. The optics are in terrible if we're spending yeah. our time in Togo, number one. But secondly, at the point where those optics aren't the issue, the second issue is that you already have people on the way. Yeah. How are you dealing? Because for me, what's even marveling here is... I don't know the solution models that are coming up in this crisis assuming this was a genuine crisis to begin with the solutions that are being proposed in this crisis don't make sense they are impractical exactly because you have a delegation delegations on their way and then your solution is no you know what let's chill let's make these few days a holiday for you how did you just quickly forget about all the people who are coming and those who are expected to come exactly so he says no we will send out a cancellation notice. My chat is the cancellation notice is going to be too late because people yeah. are already traveling. It's like, no, but the university has pulled all of its support because the 5 million they were offering was not enough. And so we refused it. I then ask, how are you refusing money from the institution, yeah. which ties the institution to the tournament? Even if it's this not enough, it's like when you're organizing competitions, even if it's one penny, it goes to something, right? So even if this $2,000 was to buy people water for the competition, that's still some functional thing that you can get it to do. Considering that water was a problem, it probably would have helped in that regard too. Yeah, exactly. 
we eventually get him to like this lecturer guy is just going off at this point talking about how the university is unreliable and whatnot and i'm like this is not helping us we need a solution because you telling us that your university is unreliable does absolutely nothing for the situation we have at hand he starts having well at least he tells us he's starting to have palpitations and he's stressed out and he leaves he leaves us there with latif who's laying on the bed that lucian was supposed to sleep in completely dazed at this point a deer in headlights i'm sure it's around this period that they called ayafa to tell him that competition is about to be cancelled <laughs> yes so this is the point where lucian calls ayafa and says hey council chair this is what's happening because this is when we're finding out this information as well we're no, angry I mean, we're hungry we've forgotten our anger we've forgotten our hunger we're now in solution mode yeah because how can you be thinking about how hungry you are it's like it's like you are hungry and all of a sudden you are put in the middle of a war with guns blazing and now you have to fight for your life so hunger becomes like third fourth priority because like you said your images were were on this bed you had back this bed right from the start and i think that's one thing we'll, we'll talk about as well down the line about the bidding process which i think council had started some reforms around it um and so we'll, we'll get there but i'm sure people would want to listen to this story to the end so let's switch back to ayafa at this point we know what happened up until you got the call that PADC is on the verge of being cancelled. As council, as council chair and an embodiment of council, how does this um, affect you? And how how was this going to change the way in which things appeared at your end? Uh, Andrews? Yeah. yeah. Ha. Huh. Nigerian network has started disturbing my life. Anyway. Um, so let me just resume from here. Yeah, so I think at this point, um, we've gotten to understand the backdrop. But really, how, how true is it, the investor pulling out? What were the events that brought us to the point where we had to consider cancelling PADC? Because um, from what I heard from other people, it was a matter of sponsors withdrawing the university, um, not maybe even pulling out, but actually dissociating themselves from the competition in its entirety as to whether they even backed it right from the start and, and the whole mess. So how does this, did this unfold down the line? Because I'm asking this because it must be mind blowing if you were put in this mess from the perspective that the investor was the one messing you up and then later find out that the person who was sitting in that room with you that night was actually the one messing up the entire process right from the start so on the third day of the tournament third or fourth day of the tournament we had been asking him to see the university um, officials that entire time yeah. So he's he keeps giving us different excuses for why we can't see them. They're not around. They're busy. They're going to call us, whatever. Eventually, on the third day, if not the fourth day, the restaurant refuses to serve lunch. Now we're, we're at a crisis because they've been paid, but they've only been paid due to the money that was coming in from Reg. And so there's some money that's missing because the yeah. allocation of funds was done with the mindset that the university was going to help oh. at that point all of these places hotels food is paid up to the extent where we could afford and would allow for us to be able to continue yeah. but they're all missing parts of their payments the food was quoted at six million in total and they had been paid 3.5 million so they needed another 2.5 million in order for that to be complete at this point we are now at a bigger crisis because it means that if people are not eating debaters are going to be even more difficult to deal with yeah lucian and i decide we're going to leave and we're with ugum sinachi and um who's this guy muhammad they're both yeah. friends of latif who had come to help him out so at this point they're both frustrated with him because he's not talking to them and he's not telling them the truth yeah we end up going to the presidency because the, the nice thing about the presidency is that as you're driving into the university, 
it's very well marked so you can see where their offices are we drive okay. there we we take a a, a gozab which is like an uber for them we get there and security is weirdly nice like we get in in like 30 seconds flat we get to these offices and both yeah. these vice presidents the administrative vice president and the academic vice president are not around okay. which is not an issue um we'll wait we wait for about four hours and neither one of them show up we eventually get sent to the director of the international office Okay. Director of the international office doesn't see us because apparently they were busy in a meeting during that time. They send us to their deputy director the following morning at 8 a.m. Okay. We get to the office of this person and this person has no idea what we're talking about. He is shocked that there's such a big tournament happening with all of these people from all of these different countries. It's also shocking for him because this is the international office where yeah, all things of this yeah. nature happen yeah. right yeah and he says i don't know what you're talking about and we're telling him no it's a lecturer from your institution who bid for the tournament his name is latif wali this man does not know a lecturer by the name latif wali what he asks for latif's number we give him latif's number he calls him and he says oh i know this person he's a student here Wait, 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 hold it. Hold it. Hold it. Yeah. See, the, the things are hitting me left, right, center. So I just, need, I just need a pause at this point. Wait. So the office of the school's, in, interna the school's international office which is supposed to, because it's an international office, obviously something of this nature, they would be, at, I think, at the center of it, coordinating international affairs and international discussions around. They've not heard about the competition. They know nothing about it. And Latif, who has been purporting to be a lecturer all this while, is not a lecturer, but a student. That is it. He's, in fact, a student at the institution. He then calls, the director, deputy director then calls another one of the lecturers in the English department who apparently yeah. is a lecturer of Latif. The lecturer okay. comes in and lecturer seems to have an idea of what's going on. Yeah. Because he's speaking from a position of somebody who's heard about the tournament before and has some yeah. work done with regards to the tournament. Okay. It is at this point that we get new information because Latif walks into the room. First and foremost, he walks into the room, he looks at us, and he walks right in, does not greet us at all. At this point, I think this is when the destroyers of PAUDC idea yeah. popped into his head that we were now destroying the tournament by being at yeah. this office. They obviously get mad at him for not greeting us, and we're like, honestly, we couldn't care less. We just want these things solved so that we can continue with the tournament and people can go home. He... it. At this point, I don't speak French, but Lucian speaks fluent French. Yeah. But I had started picking up bits and, bits and pieces because of how much French was being thrown in my yeah. direction the whole time. I pick up something about two months. And this sends me spiraling because I don't understand what's happening, but I know that the conversation is about a two-month period. Huh? Then the deputy director says, no, 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 no. There are people here who don't speak French. Let's switch to English. Yeah. Upon switching to English, we find out that the tournament had not been endorsed by the by the institution when the bid took place. The institution only finds out about the bid two months before the tournament is supposed to happen. And this is because some of the institutions had called to affirm whether or not the tournament was in fact taking place. Okay, another pause. Hold it. <laughs> Hold it, because these are like that office must be a, a, a an origination point of history, because the the two blockbusters that have happened in that office up until now is already mind blowing. Wait, so there was a, a whole bidding irregularity with the lack of an endorsement letter in twenty twenty one, I think, which was the whole premise for. Nigeria trying to re restart the entire bidding process again because Nigeria felt 
even though there had been a bidding process and the voting had occurred, blah, blah, blah. One of the key irregularities was that there was no institutional endorsement letter, which later on was brought um, by Latif to, to sort of complement that gap within the bid. And so everybody felt eventually said, like, it's fine. The institution knew nothing about it until two months before PADC. So from yes. 2021 through 2022 to 2023, December, November, October timeline is what we are talking about here. Yes. It's also important to note that the letter that is supposedly a letter that supports the tournament by the institution is a letter signed by a lecturer at the institution and the letter itself speaks to debating venues being renovated and not the institution taking responsibility to host the tournament i'm realizing this as i'm asking people can i please have the letter you guys use to ratify this thing i get the letter and i'm reading the letter and i'm like but this doesn't say the university is going to host it simply says that there are rooms and you are going to be able to debate in them. Hold it. Wait. It's me. Nah. <laughs> yeah, nah. There, are, there are some conversations you come into them knowing they will be hard, but you sort of can't anticipate how hard they would get. Because this is so for for this, I'm coming back to IAFA on this one. What the hell happened on council? Because put because th this one I won't even involve cap or I won't I won't throw it down the line of Nolutando because the council is supposed to be like the 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 iron wall, right? The iron wall where we know because I'm presuming that when these letters are submitted, council has to read because what I'm hearing now is that the letter was not even read to know what the letter was. It was just taken for what it was presented to be, which was an endorsement letter. But it was just a letter speaking to renovation of, of venues. Wow. I have what happened. OK. How did what I'm going to is add, how did it what I'm going to layer in more context. Yeah. So let's tell you how the bill got approved, yeah? So yeah. to understand how this bill gets approved, apparently, this bid has existed since 2015. So University of Lume, or more specifically Latif, has wanted to host PADC since 2015. For context, in 2015, I was a high schooler that knew nothing about BP, yeah? So 2019, this time I'm actually yeah. at PADC. <laughs> yeah. And then we tried to shoot up this bid again. It gets squashed. But a certain person sees potential in the bid and goes to reach out to these guys, yeah? And says, you know what, it's cool. Let's have this bid work, yeah? Now, the interesting part about this bid is 2020, there is no bidding process because that's hosted by Royal Victorics and I think Kiambungu in Kampala, it's online. Yeah. But in 2021, a vote needs to be passed for who is going to host in 23 because we've already agreed that 21 was, uh, 2021 was Botswana, 2022, would be Mashuja in Kenya. So, yeah. all of a sudden, because we attended the tournament, I was the head of delegation at that tournament, and this is primarily why I even got involved in council in the first place. We see an announcement about Togo hosting PADC 2023. You yeah. were in Abuja at that time because you were at Abuja debate yeah. and done PADC that year. It wasn't a great year. Got knocked out in the semis. It was disappointing. Yeah. yeah. So, I'm out there and I'm just trying to figure out what's going on and how this bid even got passed. But like, I'm like, I don't care who's hosting. As long as I can go and speak with it because they'll be. And then I see the Abuja story. At that time, UNISA is still active, yeah? So, yeah. Nolu, you remember, is it coming in about how he's being targeted with regards to the bid? Yeah? And so, we pop in and my first instinct is i'm going to discern my my guy because if you are my guy i'll protect you that's just simply how it was like he's my guy they're attacking him for no reason it makes sense then i find out more about the story which is 
letters are missing. People voted without seeing the bid. And this has a lot of question marks about it because we didn't even have a Nigerian council rep. Apparently, Eze had invited a Nigerian that spoke at the tournament to go and do the council rep role. You get? And obviously, the person just said, okay, sure, my a senior in debate asked me to go be Nigerian council rep. I'll show up. No piggy, right? So he shows up. And obviously, he votes for the one bit that is West African, which is what any rational person would do in that situation, right? So, he himself doesn't particularly understand what's going on. Yeah. And then, all of a sudden, there is all these stories about bid issues missing. And then it becomes more problematic because AZ is a CA on this bid, but at the same thing, yeah. he's council chair. Yeah. At this time, he's council chair. And like, okay, even if not for any other reason, even if I assume you had no malicious intention, you know the constitution as council chair, yeah? The barest minimum is to ensure that the bid you are seeing fulfills all those requirements without much without much mess. And yeah. it's obvious they don't. And at the point in time where they don't, you make it about you make it a personal issue when you claim that you are being targeted rather than claiming that there are actual flaws and guys, we can address this. Let's just do this. So Abuja is asking for a revolt. Yeah. Togo is saying there is no need for a revolt. At best, would like this is a targeted attempt from big countries to bully smaller francophone countries. There was an entire narrative. Even the vice chair at that time, yeah, Jeronia, yeah. ran with it. So it was a big established country, Nigeria, trying to forcefully seize a bid from a smaller country. But the smaller country didn't do the work. So just let me that's pass the first time I get involved in council. The, the, yeah. the fact that we, we start referring to Nigeria as a big country when it comes to when it comes to anything political is is, is, is is it for me. Like we are very quick to ridicule Nigeria in every other conversation, but when it suits our narrative, we would pick a big country Nigeria bullying another small country. Like let's let's come on, let's let's pick a lane and stick with it. <laughs> Essentially, what? if Nigeria is not the big, let's not everybody knows Nigeria, Nigeria is big. But, <laughs> but the issue here is then this year at, at the core of it is eventually there's like a coup that happens and then i become nigerian's council rep yeah i show yeah. up and i'm like the problem here is simple is that the bidding process is flawed and the bidding process is not just flawed because the documents are missing it's because there is meant to be a public call for bids especially yeah. because it's an online process the guy says yeah. to post in the discord like it's online you know there are a lot more difficulties involved if padc is expected to be equitable you have to communicate these things properly there is no proper communication and then the center of my mess then becomes that there are certain countries i call them one person countries because there are countries that vote on padc council where it's one guy that attends yeah. padc every year and has the sends a crony of his to attend PADC that year and has the vote and then has a vote equal to like a circuit of 300 plus people of debaters if not up to thousands yeah yeah so all of a sudden AZ has some one person countries and he made all of them register as judges just like two or three rounds disappear and he's then saying he's going to exclude certain countries because they did not participate in this online version so almost all the East African countries don't vote which is also why they don't show up for this Togo, yeah? Oh. Which is maybe not completely why, but part of why, yeah? So, the vote happens, and obviously the Togo bid passes. One person countries fall through. I think eventually, like, Togo, eventually Nigeria and Ghana just walk out. So, like, Elisha doesn't show up, but just tired. Like, yeah. it makes no fucking sense, yeah? And what's repeated about the entire event? The challenge we then have is ratification comes. And we literally say we would see a ratification. But the problem is that by the time ratification comes, it's one year, debaters are very bad at holding grudges. That, that's the problem. Yeah. You, need, you, need, yeah. you need a certain kind of fire in you to hold it. Yeah? Yeah. And they don't have it, to be honest. So by next year, like, VJ is like, oh, he doesn't want to drag the bid all the way there. He doesn't want to fight the ratification. They're looking at ratification documents and saying, guys, things are not adding up here. And it is. Latif literally admits to forging a document because he eventually produces a letter 
Yeah, the letter is on the Discord for council, I think. And there's a recording where he literally admits this signature is not from the school. This letterhead is me working my things out on this document. So because eventually he does produce the document. The challenge with that document that produces, yeah, he literally like the voice note is there. These pictures are there. This this is a crime. This is a felony. Let's let's not mince words. Ten years in French jail. That's what it is. Just so we know. You know, you know, and you know how cold I'm at this point, right how cold everybody I'm right now. Like I just at, at certain <laughs> points, I just feel shivers down my spine. Like, cause what is happening? What is what is going on? This is PADC. Wow. And like, for me, I'm I'm looking at this and I'm so, thinking, these are decisions when we're taking or when the things were happening. We thought it was just debaters having a go at each other, having some political banter, and that was all. And when we raised questions about conflict of interest, um, and you see these things, usually it doesn't matter if things go right. It starts to matter when the things go wrong. So when the bidding, whole bidding, because I was here on the on the Nigeria mm -hmm. bid, when the whole bid war was ongoing in 2021, I was silent, didn't want to talk because I know anything I say would equally be misconstrued as you are you have an active interest in it. And down the line, hearing the things that came out from PADC, I probably regret not saying anything because who knows, maybe if I had said something, somebody would equally be triggered somewhere and also say something and somebody would also say something but i look at it as from two standpoints i see two problems if you look at the dissemination of information bit i think both parties could have done better i think paedc council could have advertised better i also think nigeria on our part who wanted to host paedc could have approached and asked when we knew paedc had started and asked when is council meeting when our bids being tended in, et cetera. So maybe from both parties, actually we could have met each other halfway and we could have sorted this out. But that expectation of, yo, council should, we are waiting for council and council also says, no, we are waiting for people who are interested to show their interest. That maybe hurts everybody. But if you look at the second bit, the second bit about conflict of interest and the lack of oversight. Now for every single person who said, council chair who was as at the time was only supporting the togo bid for his interest and was ignoring due diligence would have been validated and their their notions whether i was informed by malice whether i was informed by disdain or dislike whether i was genuine concern would have been validated by the happenings at togo because down the line there is clearly lack of oversight there is lack of enforcement of every basic rule that the padc bid is supposed to be upholding because it is mind blowing for me to be hearing that the document that was presented as PADC endorsement document was simply a document that was indicating that rooms for debates are under renovation and will be available. Like in, in someone's words, how dumb can the smartest people in Africa be for this to happen under our eyes? Right, like it, it's a really big question. And I'm going to ask another thing here. I think Masheria was talking about similar thing happening in 2017, um, where there was a bid, there was lack of um, oversight, the bidding process was bad and all that. And when he was doing that episode, he said, well, he figures we've learned our lessons from it. And that's why Akofna was better or um, the subsequent PADCs have been better. And I felt that statement didn't go down the timeline drain so well because Togo just said, where, where did we learn the lessons? Get the hell out of my face. Lessons up the drain. Because oh I'm then God. sitting here thinking, what did we do after 2017, right? Did we put anything in the constitution? Did we change any of the processes? Did we intensify any oversight? Or did we just end up going back to let's put our feet in individuals to do the right thing, and then that's okay, right? And so it begs the question, what are we going to do now as well? And I would come to the, the council steps and, and conversations. But this is, I don't know, this is too much information. <laughs> 
too much information to but back to it's you still the beginning you and your team how did you do it because i'm, I'm imagining see even you are see when the earlier yeah, this were the struggle so how were the dc working with this how was the competition moving on and and i'm i must i must admit i thought this would have been really really popular on you as see especially when as it was in the competition you would have to be the one taking the single leader to make sure that because one of the difficult things about you know cup is that it means sometimes cup internally have to reduce and now you are dealing with an entire tournament headache at your back and you have to make sure you have your folk around the entire team in solidarity with you not just that but also get them probably to do some loads of extra work that they never signed up for right so how did that go down with you and, and how did the team respond to that as well you know what i think we had a team of real troopers yeah. because mm-hmm. when becky and wes arrived the first thing i told them was hey listen <laughs> this is what we're dealing with you guys can opt out of it because honestly, this is not what you signed up for. And they were like, you know what? We're in. Let's do this. Toby, same thing. I think even Lucian and Samuel came in and, and we, we all just kind of came together to try and feel like the very obvious problems that were a part of this tournament. Because I think without the entirety of that team, PAUDC would have fallen apart. But more so without Lucian and his French speaking ability, we would have completely died out. Because I think Lucian saved us a lot because of the fact that he spoke French. Because we would have missed a lot of information, especially in that meeting that was held um, in that office. Because it was during that meeting that we were able to ascertain that all of the efforts that we were putting in were as a result not of the university but of the person who had brought us here to begin with because as soon as we left that man's office he said he was going to have a meeting with the vice president and then he would call us back he left later that evening we went back to go and talk to him and he says okay so here are the problems problem number one is the school was told that we need a hundred million to make this tournament happen to bring this into perspective a hundred million in US dollars is a hundred and sixty four thousand in US dollars. No institution is going to hand a student a hundred million to do as they please. First and foremost. None. Secondly, the president who's there now says, Yeah, hey man, let's build you a committee from the institution that is going to assist you in running the tournament because no institution no institutional official in their right minds is going to be out a hundred million without having some kind of oversight obviously the conversation that happens there is that this man refused oversight as a result the institution was now unwilling to help because if you don't have the oversight why would we want to help you out mind you this is two months before the tournament and they still have to find sponsors as well to make up the balance of that hundred million that the school can't offer because the school says we'll look for sponsors and whatever we find we can add on to wait wait this is crazy so you go to the school two months before the night with you had two years in this institution, countless number of years throughout the FSI to do this. You didn't. You went four months before time. You were asking for a hundred million, a, a ridiculous amount, which means you would commit to a student. Now they've come to a point where they say we will do our best to help you if you allow oversight, which I'm presuming with the pool of the school and small they could have probably met you halfway. And that could have done a whole load of good for this person. And for this for the for the I don't know, I don't want to call it but for the lack of oversight, you 
reject and say no, you are not willing to agree to any of this. Yes. Two months to be. Yes, absolutely that. So at that point, I am shocked out of my mind. See, I'm and <laughs> what what then gets me is a significant portion of people have been told come make your payments in cash when you arrive which then for me connects now because i'm like okay so all of these payments that will be made in person would not have gone to the tournament because the institution has no idea that were collect that there was reg collected at this point because the, the the deputy director while he's talking to us is asking how are you people in these hotels and we explained to him no 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 there's reg so the reg has covered to a specific point and now we need that five million that the institution had initially offered to be able to cover the rest of the debt because it, it really did not require that much money for people to be able to be accommodated and have at least a little bit of food that they did have at the tournament as it currently stood so he's confused as to what I'm talking about as it relates to Reg, because they had no idea that this tournament had Reg to begin with. To them, the tournament was being run by the University of Lomé, and the University of Lomé was going to carry the cost of the tournament altogether. Which then brings me to like the secondary issue, which then is apparently there are multiple bank accounts that people ended up making payments to because the first bank account they were given access to was a personal bank account that some institutions refused to pay into then there was a second one um, that had its own issues as well there was a third one that people apparently paid into because at some point in one of the days um one of the hotels has a swimming pool and people were swimming uh one of the zimbabwean uh, delegates says you know we haven't received a message from uh from the west i don't know if it's western union or any other like money related thing to say that the money that we sent has been withdrawn this is towards the end of the tournament and the whole time this man has been refusing for us to see his bank statements every time we ask can we get the tournament bank statements the bank statements are not coming out and it is at this point now when this when we're being told oh we didn't know you guys were paying registration that i completely lose my mind and i'm like we're not continuing this tournament without telling everyone exactly what is going on and that's when i stop the quarterfinal i send a message and say stop the quarterfinal stop the prep for quarterfinals get everybody back into the briefing room we're going to tell them exactly what is going on at this tournament because at this point i'm tired of african men beating their chests at me thinking that it's cute because they now have audacity to talk nonsense because in front of them is a black woman when latif was standing in front of them apologizing and they all stood there all smiles because they fear him over the black woman who's sitting at the top of that particular stage where they're getting their emotions I'm sick of these men acting like Tarzan at this point, and I'm now giving them reason to deal with their issues with the person who caused them. Still nothing. What I love about debaters is that, especially debating black men, they have a tendency of acting out when there's a black woman in front of them, but put another black man in front of them, and you see just how mousy they can become because nothing comes out of them every time Latif walks into the room. Wow. At this point, I'm telling everyone what's happening. They now know exactly what is going on. And I say to them, it is now in your hands. Do you want to continue or do you not want to continue? They say, ah, you might as well continue. We're already at our rounds. Let's finish this tournament. I'm like, cool, not a problem. Let's finish the tournament. We finish the tournament. On the day of the final, we go talk to the guy at the restaurant because we have now been told that he booked for only 150 people for the gala. The gala, thank goodness, the, the guy who does food had decided that he was going to add the gala to the initial cost of food so that um, it can happen at the restaurant VIP section without additional cost. So at least we were able to do that. We get to them and we're having a conversation with this man and this man is like, ah, do you know what the issue is? The issue is that the president was initially here is a man about reputation and so 
what would have happened had he still been here is that the reputation of the institution would have come first which would have meant a yeah. hundred million would have been dispersed and the tournament would have continued without a hitch the issue is two three months before the tournament is to begin this man gets changed someone else moves into the institution he goes on to something else i don't know if he retires or something else happens or he goes into government but he moves on to something else yeah this is where things shift because the person who's there now is a man about due process does not care for this whole reputation thing is not going to be pressured into losing a significant mm -hmm. amount of money and not know where that significant amount of money is going from we even also get told even, even put yeah put the whole institutional shift like the, the president on that side first of all two months because if i think latif had gone six months before the time the president was in power commitments that needed to be made in before these changes were not happening so this is still nobody's fault not latif's fault secondly i presume that person equally requested some institutional oversight because that person is so popular about reputation they would want to have control over the turnout of events so the reputation is equally not going. It rejected reputation and institutional oversight two months the competition. There's no reason to believe if the other person was in power, she would have still accepted institutional oversight. And like I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm trying I'm still trying to process everything that's going on and trying to put in the timeline going on in my head. How bold can you and how oblivious can he be for this to like for this to happen? Yeah, no. We we had the exact same thought processes as well. We were all asking the exact same questions. How bold can you be to try and pull something like this off? And honestly, I think it 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 really hit hard on that day. Yeah. But it hit even harder on the days where people now had to leave hotels. Because on the day we were supposed to leave, on the 11th, there yeah. were some people who were leaving on the 11th and there were some people who were leaving on the 12th. Yeah. Atif tells mm -hmm. hotels that those who are leaving on the 12th are going to pay for themselves for the 12th. This is not a part of the engagement he's had with these institutions. And when he sent them a letter, the letter said that they could leave on the 12th. Now, you have hotels that are not fully paid. So like many of them had a balance of one mil or less that okay. still needed to be paid by the time people were starting to leave. In the hotel we were staying at, on the morning that Vitz was supposed to leave along with um, the Rwandan, um, the ALU guys, they were all supposed to be leaving. The guys who drove the buses showed up with their boss looking for their balance yeah latif told them to come to lucian to get the balance mind you what <laughs> so he basically tells them lucian is his boss ah. and so they must go talk to his boss is that the wrong someone that we need to find out like because I, 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 I sort of want to have a feeling that I need to look in the eye and ask, how are you doing? I sort of want to ask, are you, are you fine? And this time around, it's not the, the normal routine of, oh, how are you? I, mean, I want to really ask, are you okay? Like, are you fine? Because you know, sometimes people do things that you're like, it's out of life, it's out of stability and all that. But this is deliberate secrecy. Deliberated every step of the way, and I'm, I'm now thinking, how old can you be also to the next five million that's open to you when you have when you are in debt with all these balances that you can do? And, and now, what Latif is the Christian is born, and the Christian is also going to come up exactly. We talk, he, Lucian finally gets out, but now the lady at the hotel right is upset because she's now realizing that the i think she was owed a mill 
the mill that she's owed is not coming in because if this man still owes the buses and he's sending the buses to someone else then the conversations they had with him about accommodation are yeah. obviously mm -hmm. don't stand so she locks her gate this is already late to get to their flight and so on uh, everyone was taking that ethiopian flight was already late and she locks mm -hmm. her gate and she's like they're not going anywhere because this man needs to come here now so now people who are on the flight who are about to be are, are now, about to miss their flights literally being held because lucky is not paying hotel money yeah so luckily lucian and i had made a concerted effort in our time at that particular hotel to be as respectful and as kind as humanly possible to the people who are running that hotel and so lucian in the process and i are able to at least talk her down and she allows them to to then go off problem is now they're already running late so we now have to beg the bus driver and beg him to take them to the airport because ordering or requesting ubers is not going to work for all of those people he eventually says sure but he wants fifteen thousand sepa luckily wes because she was busy with um she wanted to buy some stuff she had gotten some of her own money changed wes pays the the fifteen thousand. they go and the lady's like okay but you guys are the people that are left behind so i'm not gonna lock you guys in but we'll just figure out if we get him arrested or whatever we give her the card of the deputy director because i'd gotten his card from him when we were there for them to make the call to say we're still being owed money and because this was oh, this cab was opened under the university of lome can you guys sort it out and then you sort it out with your student afterwards turns out in one of the other hotels a similar thing happened and in that hotel people's passports were being taken from them what this is where the doubles as an immigration officer becomes important. Apparently, an immigration officer arrived at those hotels saying people were not to be held hostage or whatever and all of those things, and people were released and allowed to go to their flights. It is when they arrive at the hotel that we are at that we realized that the so-called immigration officer is the same guy we saw on the first <laughs> night we arrived. <laughs> wow. <laughs> this is a series. <laughs> this, is, this is an entire series, like 10, ten season series. <laughs> No, I kept saying no, I'm going to I'm no. going to probably write a book and call it the Chronicles of Suffering in Togo, <laughs> because wow, wow. Mm -hmm. yeah, that was no, that was I'm, our life. I'm even tracking back to think that cup, cup, a cup member now has to take their personal money to pay for bus drivers to agree for but to the airport so that they don't lose their flight. And that alone is striking because how far can it get? The same cap members, the same cap members who had not been given money to go home, because Lucian and I, we had to have return tickets in order for us to get on the flight in South Africa. Yeah. However, all other members of cap were either from you West Africa. Home. Yes, so they were able to take a bus in or whatever, with the exception of Becky, who then had to go to Ghana in order to get into Togo. Yeah. All of these people, Becky included, don't have money to go back because they were told, pay for yourself to get here. We will pay you back when you get here and then give you money to go home as well. <laughs> no, so come get there after all this mess. And then they, they, they are still not treated for in terms of giving the refund for the expenditure to get the Togo. Then you even come to the cost of them returning back to wherever they came from. We got lucky because 
they mentioned that they needed money to go home when they arrived. Okay. And so in the process of sorting out all of these places, because we also didn't trust Latif, we made yeah. sure mm -hmm. that all of the money that they needed to go back had to their respective mm -hmm. countries had been kept aside so that they would be able to go home. Because yeah. Becky needed money for a visa yeah. out of Ghana. Mm -hmm. um, but they also needed money. She also needed money to go to, back to the border. Mm -hmm. The same was true for Toby Samuel Franco, who needed to have transport back to Nigeria and Ghana, respectively. Yeah. Same mm -hmm. thing with Zoe, who was told, yeah. mm -hmm. charter the car, have it bring you to the border, and then you'll charter one back and we'll give you money for it. Zoe went home, having received less than what she spent when she was coming, because there was really no money to give her to begin with. I have a. <laughs> I'm, I'm struggling to progress the conversation right now because it's, it's not even a conversation. A series of shocks that I'm getting. <laughs> and it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. Right? So, really. For me, I just want to understand how did you navigate this as well? Because I'm sure um, council had to meet at PADC. What were the discussions on council? And especially after these findings about how much um, council have literally been played. Like to, to this point, council had been toyed with more like a kid that you are giving, giving candies to and, and luring them to do your bidding without them knowing what is happening. So how did council react to this on grounds and also um, moving on from, from the competition? Also, also, so I'm just going to start with like what we first did. And to be fair, our first approach was fairly radical. Yeah, because once I get on ground, I at first believe Latif's story, which is there is limited funds and all of that. But then the nigerian in me kicks in and that means like the shitload of trust issues and everything yeah so i do the math if i took 200 dollars right now i went to abuja where i live a much more expensive city than lume i would be able to house myself comfortably for 10 days so i sit down and say the math the math really isn't math it, yeah so I do some research about the cost of the food and some research on hotels. I remember asking like Nolu for pricing and doing some math on the background. And I realized one, cause my union personally refuses to pay reg and says, this is what we're going to do. We're going to give you an administrative fee of $30 per person for the everything. We're going to get our own food and our own hostels. And, as the, and we did our math and we were in the green. So, the first thing that comes to me is this guy is withholding something from us definitely. So I have a meeting with HODs, head of delegation. This is not country reps. This is like a very large council meeting. And I said, guys, what I want you guys to do tomorrow is show up and refuse to debate. Let everybody refuse to debate. I had a prior conversation with Lucian because Lucian is also on council despite being like a TAB member. And I say, Lucian, I need you to lock down TAB. Kick out Ayodele and let everybody die. I just try to get to the movie until we get proper answers. Now, at first he said agrees, but after much consultation, he says, nah, fuck this. These debaters have no balls and they're not going to do this shit. So we say, okay, let's put the middle ground. The middle ground is them bringing letters that are targeted towards their embassies and us leveraging and threatening that if he doesn't, and if Latif doesn't send those letters, or he likes doesn't handle things, we're going to send those letters and Interpol is going to come for him, yeah? Now, this, now, the next morning, I put this in the H H HOD group to remind everyone, get your letters ready, be good to go. And this is why I don't fucking read letters for shit. The first thing that happens is, I'm upstairs in the hotel bar and the hotel lobby, and Latif calls me and tells me, this is Togo, that, they speak French here, and this is not how we do things. <laughs> Maybe I don't know. I don't know whether it's the street to be, or I'm just I'm just stubborn. Hmm? 
Fuck you and fuck Togo. And you can't be threatening me when you're doing the wrong thing. If you think you are right, show up and have a meeting with the rest of the HODs and then actually engage what the fuck is going on. And I'm very angry at this point. Like, I'm shouting. I'm sweating because Togo is hot. The AC isn't working. I'm mad. And eventually, the boss comes and he takes us. Now, I'm waiting for HODs to bring at least the letters. And everybody's giving me an excuse. Everybody has a reason why they don't have their letters. I'm just looking at these guys and I'm like, you guys deserve this shit because I'm so mad. Like, my school has the letter ready. We're ready to send. We've contacted the Nigerian embassy from the day we arrived. They even got us our hotels. So we, we, are, we are taking action really fast. But these guys, they were all giving excuses. Next thing, people's patrons start running up on me and saying, why am I trying to cancel the tournament? Because apparently Latif had gone to have a meeting with them and had said I was trying to cancel the tournament by calling for a boycott. Now, the thing about the patrons is that patrons got fairly decent hotels, to the best of my knowledge. They had hot water. They had ACs. And they had fairly decent rooms. I knew people that were living in places that could barely count as brothels. Yeah? So, I'm like, you know, so I'm already really incensed. But big shout out to Ghanaian patrons because they have my back. They say, whatever decision I choose to take is legitimate. The core of it is we made this action to boycott. The boycott obviously falls through because we have like genuine issues with people being able to follow through and just simply having courage and audacity. And I'm like, okay. The patrons then say we should calm down and that boycotting is not the solution. They're going to come into the print with the um, head of the school. I personally have no faith in that process. Until now, they haven't met with the school delegation to the best of my knowledge. The next thing we do after that is in later council meetings, we have a discussion about what the punishment for Latif is. So update on that. I think in our last communique, we sent Latif a seven day period to respond. That period has expired, right? So yeah. now we have to take action. <laughs> of the Africa debate community once again. We need to write letters and get this front star in prison. People cannot be scamming us and getting away with it. I beg you, please this time, show that you have courage. The same courage some of you used to shout at CAP members and harass council. Bring it now. <laughs> and write the garden letter and get it signed and send it to your local ministries of foreign affairs or embassy so we can get this thing solved, please. No, but, but yeah, but, that's what council but, is up to. On that. I mean, that's before I, I, I even go on here. Let me ask, I have a question to ask you, Ayafa, but let me just first ask you why did you start laughing when he started talking about? The whole uh, punishment and I find it rather funny. I think for a couple of reasons. The first is that I think our council has a beautiful cap capability to blow hot air. I don't think there are people in the debating world who blow hot air more than the council. And they will continue to blow hot air because yeah. the only time they have audacity is when they want to be disrespectful to the wrong people. Yeah, It's never going to be at a point where they have to make something actually happen. Because if council really, really were as functional as they want to say they are, they would have gotten to the institution before we did. Yeah. We brought to the institution before council did, which is extremely weird considering that we honestly had no business going to that institution to begin with. Yeah. We got to the issue of what was actually happening and they got that information from us when we should have been getting that information from them because all they do is sit around in those weird ass meetings where they blow smoke up each other's asses and try and like stroke each other's egos instead of getting it done the one thing that you're going to get from council is nothing but noise even ayafa himself there was a point where it got so bad between ayafa and cap that we yeah. were ready to leave and have him take on our duties 
Because Ayafa himself was being a pain in our ass. How, we have we have a difficult tournament. The tournament itself is difficult because demographics are skewed towards West Africa because there are a lot more West African teams, a lot more West African judges. Yeah. The Zim delegations are saying we're rigging the tournament against them. Right? And yeah. them saying we're rigging the tournament against them is quite simply because we have an insane amount of judges who are coming from the same space. A lot of them being K-Nast judges. Already, yeah. this is an issue. Ayafa goes on to one of the groups and Ayafa says, why do you have judges from the same institution in one deliver in one room? Mind you, that institution has broken the most judges because they brought the most judges and because they yeah. had the better quality of judges there. Knowing the fact that there's this whole controversy around the rigging of the tournament going on, council chair, understanding the role that they have, opens their big mouth hole and writes something in the group that has the potential to incite a whole lot of nonsense and then has the gall to come and talk to us about how the tournament is run in a way that they don't particularly like. This is the same council and council chair who have failed to do proper oversight. The same council and council chair who have not been able to access Latif and the institution since we got there. Not only are we trying to make your job easy, we've also taken on a job that should actually have been yours. And then we have the gumption, the very courage of a black man when they are talking to a black woman to talk nonsense on a group that potentially could incite a whole lot of drama in an already tense situation. Ayafa can be here and grandstand about all of the things that he did, but what he cannot do is remove a lot of the problematic things that he himself got involved in during that tournament. Ayafa yeah. for a big part of that tournament behaved like a child. Ayafa, um, and this is going to be, I think Nolu has to some extent a fair point here. Let's be clear. This is not Nolu blaming you for um, the bidding war and the irregularities and the processes because as it was council chair at the time, we've all established that. But when you went to Togo, because you heard about the post, the probable cancellation of the competition from Lucien before you got to Togo. And when you got to Togo, you as council chair, um, up until Nolu and Lucien had got to had gone to the institution, hadn't gone to the institution. Council hadn't taken a decision to do that. What was council waiting for? What, what was council doing up until that point of the competition? Because up until this point, things were terrible. I think you yourself admit to that as well. So what was council doing within that period? Yeah, Ayafa, can you? Hear oh, okay, me? let me just let me just. Start. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can. Let me just start with the day I arrived because I think it put context with things. Yeah, so on the very first day I arrived, the first thing I do after going up to see Cap guys, tell them hey hi and everything else is, my team goes into the rooms and they're like they're not staying here, and me I know that's a challenge because I'm trying to be as understanding as possible, and I like. It seems like in bad faith for me to bring my own team and they say they're not going to stay in the hotels. So the first thing I do is I go down and they do have significant issues with the hostels that are legitimate. So I go talk to Latif and I'm like, Latif, what are the solutions we could have here? And it's, it's a fairly expansive conversation that involves a bunch of the issues we face. And we have it quite well. Like, very in-depth, very honest conversation about what's going on. And it's really helpful. Is the school isn't like last minute funders have pulled out, the school is trying to help. And okay, yeah, so okay. have a con or try people into the guest house, like the uni guest house. And it's like, oh, there's some challenges there, but nah, nothing major. And that you try and commun communicate with them in like on Monday. Now, the problem I have with Latif is every single issue we had, I genuinely have a conversation with Latif about the issue, and I prefer a solution. 
He comes to meet me about the we have a conversation about the water issue. Before even the boycott, I tell Latif, if pure water isn't allowed, then go carry sachets of water into the hotels where it's allowed, like sachet water, and then give people there. A lot of these people have water bottles, or they could buy that really big ever water bottle and just keep refilling it, right? So that means everybody's going into the location with some amount of water, and that solves the problem very quickly. Latif says, I'll do that. I keep bugging Latif, nothing gets done. The problem is, so much like CAP, I don't have access to funds to execute things on my own. I did not collect registration. Money. I have yeah. I so. Have I have I I think what we are, what, what the question here is, is not whether or not you had access to resources. I think it's like getting money. worse. The, the question here is, did you, what? did council ever consider going to the institution? What was blocking council from doing that? Because from Nolu's perspective, council was speaking, but council wasn't acting. And one of the things council could have acted on was exploring the option of going to the institution and looking at what was really wrong because CAP eventually ended up doing that. And so what was council, what did council consider that what were you guys waiting for? Because that's what I want to understand at this point. Uh, Andrews, can you hear me? What's the question? Yes, I can. I'm asking, that yes, what's the, the question? question from 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 Nolu? Because of course nobody would expect you to take money and resolve an issue because you don't have the resources. But at any was there a point where council considered going to the institution? If you did, what stopped you up until Cap had to step in to go to the institution? And if you didn't, why was that consideration okay, not made yeah. by council as well? So the entire point of having the boycott or gathering those letters was to force Latif to take us to the institution. That was the goal, yeah? And the reason we end up not doing that is that after applying that pressure, patrons get involved and say, you know what, we are staff, we are lecturers, we can communicate with these particular institutions and with VCs better. Because some of the people there, some of the patrons are literally fellow vice chancellors. So they're like, we can't communicate better. So Latif is going to take us, and we're going to apply pressure on Latif. We are much older people. Just delegate this to us. Now, in good faith, I can tell you, first and foremost, I don't trust you enough to give you this role. Second and foremost, second and foremost, to convince a lot of these particular patrons to come back next year, because a bunch of them were really disappointed by what they saw, especially first timers. So the very logical thing to do in that position was to ease up on things and actually tell them, you know what, please do this. I constantly end up checking up with them, and each time they're like, oh, they've not been able to do this, or they've not been able to gather enough people to get the right number, or Latif has ghosted them. And at this point, the tournament is flowing. It's flowing. So if I choose to have another one, especially showing the fact that most of the council members and heads of dedication didn't even put their back in the first one, it probably wasn't going to work. On the flip end, and I think this is where I need to respond towards, and I'm going to respond to this because I feel like I did some parts wrong, but there were genuine things I did right that I'm being held accountable for that I don't think I did wrong, yeah? One, and I think this needs to be put in context. My issue with the round was you had three judges from the same institution in a panel now, I do not disbelieve that CAP had significant challenges or significant like restrictions in the reason why they pulled that off. But what I do think is that, especially in context to, in context to the teams that were in the room, the process seemed fairly inequitable because it becomes a very hard sell. Don't feel you were schemed against or targeted by a certain institution to just kick you off. And just to be clear, this isn't the first time this has happened at PUDC. It happened in an in-round in 2021, and it became a big enough mess. Round 9. I think Erasmus remembers what I'm talking about in Round 9, where in, I think, the second top room, there was a massive mess where there were two judges from the same institution and one from another institution. Just, just so we don't end up delving too much into into individual happenings at at PADC. For me, I'll just point out here that um, given the 
the amount of access council chair has with cup and given the context of the competition i would be very firm to say in such instances because i'm very cautious about people who say things that could inflame the public and give a wrong impression and especially for council chair um even like i can agree with everything i have i say in regarding the the concerns three people from the same institution judging but you eventually went to cap so if you could have gone to cap right from the start why do you start from making a statement on a public platform that creates brouhaha about the whole situation before you end up going to the people you have access to who could do something about it right and so for me i don't think you were you you i don't think maybe what you okay. did was wrong i just don't think should i explain this right. so i don't want us to delve so much into the individual scenarios as well because of course we want to have a complete sense of what happens now before we delve a little bit into these council is trying to do something and for me, I'm questioning because the bigger question I have, and Erasmus can weigh in here, the bigger question I have is writing letters to ministries of foreign affairs, th those are not going to get Latif anywhere. Those are not going to get anybody into any serious accountability metrics. What within the scope of council's powers are you willing to do? Are you willing to ban him and anyone who is implicated within that process from PADC or African competitions? What is within the scope of council? Are you reforming? What are the strengths of these reformations? What is the timelines to execute these reformations? Because up until I heard that this happened in 2017, a similar thing happened in 2017 from Masharia, I was thinking, because I've, I've not been here for that long, I was thinking maybe there's a first time something of this magnitude is happening, so would learn from it. But to think it happened in 2017, we didn't put in place because I don't see any lessons from 2017 reflected in the constitution. So we didn't put in place any major blockades to try and prevent that from happening again. What is council doing and what can council do? Because Erasmus, council gave a seven day ultimatum. That seven day ultimatum has passed. We've still not seen any major actions. We are yet to see what council will bring about, but I'm not sure if you have any thoughts on what council should do at this point. Yeah, thank you very much, Andrews, and I still hope you can hear me. I think yeah. yeah, I think there are two sides to the blade over here. One, we just need to understand that council's powers is quite restricted in the amount of change uh, that they are able to enforce over here. And in as much as we want to push for measures of accountability, I think we must be very tact in how we execute this. I think that what I wouldn't want to be the situation or what I wouldn't want to see within the continent is also um, just all of a sudden giving council powers to ban. Undeserved amounts of power. Yes, to ban and do all these sorts of things that people are calling for. And um, because even if IFS council is a good council, We've seen some horrible councils, um, not not even too long ago. I'm not even say not even like a year ago. So this <laughs> yeah. that could be the same makeup or composition which would be having these sorts of powers we've given yeah, to them in, yeah. in, the, in this kind of crisis. So for me, I think the conversation is much deeper and much more nuanced than we're making it to be. But I do believe that there needs to be measures so that's that's why i think it, it needs to start from an introspection of the african continent uh, itself that means a yeah. revision of the constitution and what we think are the most fundamental things to protect that means yeah. beginning to put in those accountability structures and barriers not on the people organizing the tournaments but even on council themselves because they yeah. themselves have to share the blame even if it is not like this the same people who came in there and that's for me is the two two edges of the sword that i'm really looking forward to we need to take action now but then also not fall into the trap of recreating this situation um a couple of years later from from here yeah i mean for before i go back to to ayafa um who i, I would allow some time to talk about this in detail I'll just like to chip in Nolu here. 
Um, I think we all agree that this council is limited in its capacity to enforce punishment after a wrong has been done. But what the council then can do is to prevent, put structures in place to try and prevent the wrong in the first place. And that's why matters of oversight, matters of accountability, matters of due process, ensuring that the, the way in which these bits are approved. Because I, I, I listen to what, what I've heard on this episode and I'm asking myself, were there people who were looking at these letters? Did anybody read? Did anybody approve anything? Like, what's, what happened, right? So what are the things that council can then put in place to prevent these things um, so that we at least allow them to enforce preventative measures rather than waiting for them to enforce punitive measures that we need to have the capacity to Yeah, so I think with the same whip I just hit IAFA with, I must give credit where credit is due. Because what the current uh, group of members of council have at least been able to begin conversing about is how to make oversight a lot more possible, but also a lot more effective. One of the things that um, they've spoken about is the potential of having an oversight officer that does a visit to the country that is going to be hosting and the institution to ascertain the readiness of that institution a few months before the tournament is to begin. So with, I think credit must be given in that regard when it comes to some of the things that they are coming up with as it relates to how they can strengthen um, that oversight. I think that was a really good thing on their part. But secondly, I think what is important is all institutions who are bidding must have an institutional official who is on the bid and is on the bid on the basis of what their designation is in that institution. What that allows you to do is have direct access to the institution in terms of direct as it relates to readiness and what they've currently done, what they're currently doing. Because for example, the VITS bid has a letter and that letter has an email address. It has a phone number from someone from that particular institution. I think creating that and making it a norm that is going to ultimately govern the way you engage is something that's going to be important. But I also think someone who's not from the institution that is hosting, but in the same country, in a university in the same country, needs to be a contact person that has direct access to the institution, that the institution knows to be the council rep within the country that is going to gain information from them. Because I think IAFA will send emails. IAFA will make phone calls and he can only have that much reassurance that the person he's calling or um, emailing has actual information to give him or that the information that they're giving him is accurate. If this thing with the current letter that we were dealing with is anything to go by, it's probably true to say that letters are not the best way to ascertain whether or not people are in fact ready. So. Of the things that they've already done, I think they can definitely add a singular person who's within that country who can be able to do full readiness checks by going to the institution and being shown what is going to be used for the tournament a good two, three months before the tournament so that all institutions can be given a clear go ahead in terms of buying tickets for people to go to that said tournament. How that can happen is also now a question because on the practical end of things, you then have red tape at institutions. Um, institutions, a lot of the time, don't want to have some random person coming into their institution and telling them what to do or telling them, we want to see whether or not you're ready. There has to be a degree to which we begin to engage the legitimacy of the council in being able to bring about any kind of enforcement as it relates to how they engage with institutions. I think one of the ways in which that can be done is that all institutions debating unions have somebody from the institution who's directly engaging student affairs as it relates to that. I think all institutions now need to begin their engagement with their student affairs counselors and, and, and people who are involved in that to be able to create a space where we can have those kinds of relationships with the institutions as it relates to peer UDC specifically. And 
that might be one of the ways in which we're at least able to maintain legitimacy and also ascertain whether or not a bid is in fact legitimate. Yeah, I just want to add one or two lines to this. I think it's what Nolu said is even way more important in terms of the posterity um, of debate within those institutions and within the circuits as a whole. So, so this even goes beyond just having that particular tournament. In most cases, the interactions and the relationship we've had with um, debate institutions are, is what serves as the foundation for the survival of that institution, even within the debate space itself. It means that if we're able to have deep and, and good and formal interactions with those institutions, it means we can continue to count on them to even bring their students to the next PAUDC, to bring their students to Worlds. I, I think the trajectory of African debate, especially because we know that we can't go by these institutions, would be to begin to embed ourselves. And that comes from creating that legitimacy, as she points out, within council, creating that level of organization and readiness to be able to engage with these institutions at the level at which they like because you know they like bureaucracy yeah. you know they like red tape so you need to look organized you need to start having formal relations with them you need to have interactions so i believe that if the individual who is put on that bed needs to show a level of collaboration between like the, the school itself and, and the convener, we need to have someone from that school just willing to represent that bid on that level and not just like putting the institution's name um, um, on it. Because I think by establishing those relationships with those institutions, debates can continue to benefit from it um, um, even into the near future. Yeah, um, for me, I've also asked this question a couple of times. Is it time for PEDC Council to now start writing officially to institutions to solicit for bids and so instead of waiting for a few students to put their heads together and say you know what we are now we think that it's togo's time or it's south africa's time or it's it's nigeria's time we say look let's have an official compilation of all institutions emails be it to their student affairs be it to um, their vice chancellors or presidents or academic offices or international offices, as many official emails, because it's the same email. You are just going to be doing a BCC and send it to every single email that you have on that mailing list. And then have council take proactive steps to officially invite institutions to bid for PADC. And in that invite, be very specific about what are these institutions in for? What are the expectations of them as well? So we also start, like you are saying, meet them on a much more official level than dealing with them on a student level and subsequently hoping that the students make things official with the institutions, which sometimes doesn't happen as we've seen in the case of, of the execution of Togo as well. So Ayafa, um, as we near the end of this conversation, I want to ask um, what other things are council considering? Because I think like we've all seen, council may not be that strong in terms of punitive capacity, but could be strong in terms of preemptive capacity to put structures in place to limit the kind of damages that are done in here. So we've seen certain publications. What is the end goal for council? What do you seek to achieve? Um, and are you considering as council yourselves putting out an official call to institutions to start collating bids from an institutional level? Because I know all other sporting organizations do this, like sports, um, football, or athletics. They source these hosting bids from an institutional level. So are we looking at getting to that point? And what are the steps to get there as well? OK. so. A bunch of things. One, I think the long-term goal of council is to ensure council has a much better structure. Because if there's one challenge I've noticed, at least from my first year in council, it's council oftentimes just tends to be a collection of 15 to 20 random people that are really interested in doing this random small bit of PAUDC and show up. So when you're trying to get follow through, because council is in fact a one-year commitment, 
it becomes really hard to get that follow through from people. So even doing things as simple as sending letters, writing communiques can be really difficult. So by creating a significant amount of structure in there, we can assure that there is at least to some degree consistent communication and then benefits towards that consistent communication. So it's why, for example, we're trying to implement oversight, having some sort of council structure, council fee to ensure council can do certain things. And then there is also the plan to domicile and register council in Botswana. I think most of you have seen that communication. So we have an office, we can operate out of there. Yeah, don't, don't know if I can quickly jump in here. I'll, I'll just yeah. say that um, some of these discussions that they need to have them in and it's it's really a complex web we have entang entangled ourselves in and that's what happens when you just allow things to happen over a number of years because some of these conversations require to go on for a long time to be able to um create consensus and to be able to create a level of acceptance to be able to think about all possible implications before they are done what the last thing we would want is to get ourselves caught up in a lot of like logistical and yeah. financial challenges in, in trying to put together these innovations so i'll just say that the move should always be for um easy to scale and easy to implement um uh changes or legislation especially in the short term and we need to create a bit of um a cornerstone with regards to council and the conversations that needs to happen look we know those who are interested in African debate and African debate progress. Like Nolu has been here for years now. I have been here for years now. Um, and you see, are too. we know people who are demonstrating these passions. There needs to be a way to continue to pull these guys to get involved. People like Boemo, Charity. There needs to be a way to create that level of continuity in them. I think in as much as the dreams of people are noble to join council for a year or two, it cannot be sustainable if we sort of have 15 people shuffling in between every year yeah there there needs to be a way to um incorporate people who just have the passion to want to continue to help debate because i think the impact of what we're doing is too important and far too widespread just to to be left to the interest of of, of just a few people yeah i mean that's that's absolutely true you look at some of the best debating circuits like look at the nsda the american debating association and and you look at these are lecturers some of these people have been teaching for decades and they are in there and they have that institutional memory to say we've been running this for the past 20 years we know where it started from we've we've encountered mistakes we've learned our lessons we've put in place plans executed them see them succeed We've built long-standing relations with sponsors as well. And so there is an institution that is recognized that you can have a relationship with to build upon. And I think that's similar to what we are talking about. It's time we equally start looking at, I know there's this whole useless concern about when the older generation are involved in debate, the younger generation feel their interests are being suppressed. But the question is, I think every single person who cares about the sport cares about a simple thing, which is to improve the sport, to sustain it and to grow it. And so if it's about getting these people with their experience in here so that we can still grow and sustain the sport, it's very, very important that we are able to maintain that. Right. Um, and so we'll just go around and get a, a few final comments from everyone. Uh, first, let me start with you, Nolu. Um, I'm tired on your behalf after what I heard happen oh, before. Man. Like I'm, I'm serious. I, because the thing is that be, because I wasn't there, I was, and I was also very like tied up in work within that period because there were some competitions around. I wasn't really paying attention to what was happening, but I was hearing people complain to the point that one time someone entered my DM. I shared something about the podcast, and someone entered my DM and said, "Why aren't you talking about Togo with all that's happening?" And I'm like what is happening and the person said i can't even begin to speak so 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 i was like this is this is getting out of hand i'm sort of tired on your behalf but i would just also like to say that for 
a lot of people who will be listening to this episode, I'm sure they would be grateful for not giving up on PADC. Um, like I have always told you, me personally, I don't know how I'd have reacted. I don't know how I'd have gone through it. But just to say congratulations to you and the team once again. Um, um, good job for council for taking much more proactive steps, but we hope to see some of these things materialize as quickly as possible so that we can make sure that subsequently and I've, I've also just to commend them i've seen them put some demands on the uganda bid as well in anticipation of some of these issues to force the uganda or come to respond to these issues before a go-ahead is given for their hosting rights and i would as far as go to say if it means having another togo we would be much better off suspending PADT for a year just to get things right before we host it again. And so I hope things fall in line so that we can be able to host it successfully. So just final words from you after the ordeal uh, you and your team had to endure and, and now being here, what do you have to tell the, the African and the Look, man, at this point, I think we, we come to the realization that we have to make peace with it. We're all trauma bonded <laughs> through Togo. And we've all come to know that at some point, things are going to go wrong. Uh, you're going to have to figure out how to make them go right. And hopefully Togo was a lesson in multiple things for many of us. Um, and that hopefully from Togo, it can only go up. And more than anything else, I think it now becomes a situation of we need to create that institutional memory. We need to create a space that is more intentional in terms of utilizing its institutional memory to ensure that we have not only better peer UDCs, but that we have better circuits altogether. And so I think this is the point where we, as an African circuit, especially those of us who are now starting to move out of the circuit because i mean careers are now starting to do what they need to do i think it's time for those of us the older generation of debaters to start having conversations about how we assist this newer incoming generation of debaters because i think there's a lot that could have been done preventatively for togo if for example in if enough people had given ayafa space to assist and even engage them as council chair throughout his term heading into togo i think a lot of people needed to support him a little bit more than what we did myself included because i think the only thing that i was really focused on was the cap end of it i think a lot of support could have been given to the council a lot of support could have been given to him as council chair in particular because i do think that even though there are instances where he and I disagree a lot. I do think that a lot of what he does comes from a good place. And so when you see people do things that come from a good place, there has to be an, in an instance where you like come in with the experience to then assist them to carry things through. So I do think that us, we need to have a conversation among ourselves about what our role needs to be in assisting these ones to continue the legacy of PAUDC and also grow debating even further in Africa. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, down to you, Ayafa. Uh, final words on this episode to the African Debating Circuit. Okay, so first off, yeah, I think a big part of what council needs to say and a big part of what council needs to do going forward is already in the process of being done and we would appreciate your support in following through these things because i feel like a big part of the process isn't just council getting things done but as nolu rightly said the circuit engaging with the things council is trying to get done so i think one there should be the belief that council actually does operate with a significant amount of goodwill at least I can say PADC is probably like the most significant tournament I've won in my career. So if it goes to shit, my career goes to shit too. So like I do have significant incentives to see do well, but beyond that, everybody on ground likes the tournament and we like traveling and going for PADC. So yeah. I think there is an incentive to see things get 
and we on councils and we've seen our issues one we think we have an issue with communication and having frequent meetings which is why we've moved our meetings to happen a lot more frequently we're giving out communiques a lot more regularly so people will get updates all i'm asking for is to engage and please guys come for uganda at least based on the conversations that we're having with them i can genuinely assure you that it's definitely going up because i think you won't be socialized are, the, the bar is at the bottom right now. so it has to go up but we are actually ensuring that we deliver a very top quality tournament yeah and i yeah. think for the issues that happen in togo I, now oftentimes when people have different opinions clashes must occur and obviously clashes did occur i have apologized for at least the parts where i do genuinely believe i was wrong and i hope like i think we've all let it go at this point because as nolu rightly said they are trauma bonded and everything but yeah moving on from there like i do hope you guys don't stop believing in pedc and yeah, yeah. come for uganda i'm sure you believe it like wonderful stories yeah um erasmus yes. down to you now uh final words for the african debate community for a two-time from a two-time African debate champion. I'm sure you two, just like Ayafa, if we plug PADC right now, your two years have been down the drain. So people want to hear from you. It's it, it's incredible. I think the one thing people don't understand is how legacy works. Yeah, We are all roped in this, whether we like it or not. Um, and yeah. imagine bragging somewhere that you've CAD PADC, you've won PADC, whatever. And the next day you have people like just cheap talking it and kicking it in the dirt. You are not going to feel good because no matter what you do, it is a part of you. And for yeah. me, it's even just beyond me because it's easy to be able to also rest on more current achievements, but recognize the efforts that you put within the space. And I think it calls on all of us. So for me, my call would be to um, all of the alumni, all of the legends, all of these people who have debated before. And I think that is one of the reasons why we have this platform to be able to create a sense of community and then bring them on board, listen to their ideas, get their guidance and direction moving forward. So for me, I'll call for all former debaters, not former, you never become former if you're a debater. Um, someone says that uh, footballers can hang their boots because like they are old and um, everything and they are yeah. tired and you have weak bones but for debaters we we can't hang our boots because we use our minds and if your mind yeah. is dead then you are dead so you are always a debater please come on board let's join some of these discussions and then get things rolling but for me i think where the back falls first is in being able to ensure accountability we need to yeah. ensure that there are consequences for what happened one way or another we need to ensure that for me it begins with those who even voted for the bid in the first place and all of the processes that went through if not for anything for me i'm going to use my voice and the platform to ensure that we shame them and uh, i wrote something on the wadic debate page the other time there is no small boy in debate there is no fandom yeah. in debate i and it, it goes i think the last time we had this conversation i was even saying that um it, it would hurt me if someone says that because I trained them and um, they are going to follow everything I say or do everything I say. Yeah. Debate teaches you to critically think. So if we have debaters who cannot live that life, who think about issues and would follow politics and follow issues and some of these things, you are not thinking, you are not a debater. And for me, once you are not a debater, I don't see you as a part of me and I'll hit you with every being and every blood and bone in me because you are not thinking and you are not a debater so for me those people at least hall of shame we should get them in even if we can't get counsel to do anything and we need to remember their names say it whenever we are talking about failures say their names boldly and every generation should remember them because they are complete disgrace to the african continent and what we call um debating secondly for me i think just um, as a point to counsel moving forward, yeah. the level of discourse should be expansive and involve all of the African circuits. Um, myself, I'm looking to ways in which we, we can be able to create a vehicle for this discourse to go on and on and on, but it needs to be expansive yeah. enough to involve different people. We need to yeah. create 
like I have said, better structures to be able to engage because when you have organizational strength and i've had the privilege of living within the western world and just realizing that having organizational strength even sometimes without depth can give you some form of buying and access and that can be very very good yeah. if you look to asia they're very very serious in terms of their organizational yeah. setup they may not have the most talented debaters and coaches or whatever but we are already even seeing people moving there because of the huge organizational setup that they have and we need to begin to see more of that. Part of that will also mean that we need to show people the opportunities that exist within debates to continue to have a career, to continue to have a legacy. People think they need to debate and stop. And um, for example, Andrews, you work within a debate institution where you are getting well paid. Um, yeah. I'm, not, I'm sure you don't want people to know that, but he's getting paid really well. <laughs> Um, even more than some why, people who, why are you went ahead, on my <laughs> who went ahead to have different careers. So there are opportunities within yeah. debates to grow, build careers, to have a love life, to do whatever. We need to encourage people to stay within the space and then be in the Is the love life reference to you, by the way? Oh, it's for everyone. It's for Ayafa. <laughs> <laughs> so the last thing i just want to say is we need to show yeah. our best our best side to the world we need to and um, speak of yeah. debates well and we need to transport the best it means that creating a legacy plan creating a level of continuation being able to share um our skills what we've been able to learn within these spaces and that means we have people willing to learn not people who would message you and say partner me so i can win this trophy people who are just holistically want to be good human beings and want to be assets within the, the community who want to learn some of the nitty gritties and enter into these world spaces because I think we need to take the step forward um, to places like WDC onto the world stage and begin to now also have um, a level of influence and that's when when the pipes are aligned that's when we can have it flowing all of the benefits because there's a lot of goodies out there but it's not flowing down because we don't have the setup to be able to take on some of these good things. So um, yeah. over the years, of course, there'll be more discourse around these things, but I think that um, um, the future is bright for Africa. Yeah, for those who have never heard Erasmus whip, this is a classic whip speech from Erasmus. <laughs> like he, start, he starts telling a story. To be fair, like when I when he was speaking, I was just I was just listening. This like Erasmus classic whip speech. He starts telling a story, and then things he picks them in themes, and then he just whips them all over the place. But but um, thank you all for for joining. For me, I I think that like Ayafa said. And, and everybody has alluded to this, participation from members of the community is key and getting them informed is key. There's this sense of relevance that you gain by getting people informed of what you are doing most of the time. And if council is doing things and people don't know about it, in my mind, I, I barely even recognize or remember council exists up until PADC starts and there's some whole thing about bid or some random chats that, oh, council is having a meeting. I'm like, whoa, we had council, right? Because up, after Kenya, I've never heard of council until Togo. And that's the reality that we barely hear anything from council. There's zero communication, there's zero interaction. And for me, I think Erasmus and I would, would offer to do this anytime. If council wants to have reasonable, like have meaningful updates they want to have a quick session to chat and then spread this word across beyond um communiques because there's so much you can say in a communique but sometimes maybe reflect more on the process the rationale behind certain decisions that council are taking we would always be happy to offer the platform for council to speak to the african debate community as well and i'm sure these are things that people would want to listen people are eager to hear what is council doing what is the steps that council is taking to make sure that next time would be much more protected, would be much more cared for at the next PADC that we attend? For me, I think PADC is, is a huge, um, it's a huge competition that is for for anybody who looks outside into Africa, the most respected competition would be PADC. So, like Erasmus says, our, our entire pride is tied to it when people look down on us or look up on us, every single person is tied to it. When I'm here and you ask me, or if anybody sees me around and asks me, what competition will you recommend for me to go or to attend in Africa? I'd obviously say PADC because 
in my head, that would be the most trusted competition to reflect the best of Africa's competitiveness structures. Ask yourself, which other competition in Africa on an African stage has a council that's meant to regulate the way in which things happen? None, except PABC. And that reflects the importance of that competition as well. And so for me, like Erasmus said, it touches everybody. And so um, it's been great having this discussion. It's good for people to know how come people became Togolized and what happened in Togo. Uh, for me, it's it's like I've had I've had things. To be fair, I've had things on this episode. I came in prepared to be shocked, but I was electrocuted. And so right now, it's it's beyond the shock that I came in prepared for. I need to go for rehabilitation. But thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nolu. Thank you, Ayafa. And thank you, Rasmus, for, for joining in on this episode. People would love to listen to this at length in the coming week. And we hope to have a much more. We also hope to reconvene sometime later to discuss the progress report of things that have been done. Um, hopefully, we would host another episode um, early next year to discuss, especially after the resolutions of Uganda, to discuss where council is on so that we have a much more consistent interaction with the PADC build-up process as well. So, so, yeah. so Andy, I have a last call, and this is to everyone. Please like, share, subscribe. Um, debate is like only as important as the reach we have. So within yeah. your friend groups, mm, like yeah to also to our guests yeah like share within your friend groups let them know like there are cool stuff in debates let them know about the shafts let them connect because i think that it, um, it can have sort of like the impact we're looking to have if we're able to like people can tune in and see that debate has a podcast we have like some 2k followers or hopefully 20k yeah. by next year like it helps yeah. especially in terms of the branding and the approach that we have so please share that this share and uh, to your union members, to all of your friends, and let them subscribe and, and listen to the episode. Thanks. This will be the last thing I say. I don't know why, when Erasmus said there are good things in debate, the statement that popped up in my head was that there are good things in debate beyond Togo. But anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> and, and thanks for joining this episode. See you sometime. Bye, guys. <laughs>